Um, I'm going to start with a silly little poem, which I think a couple of people in this room will recognise, because it was done as a result of uh, a poetry workshop where we had to all pick objects which might be found in a bathroom and then put them all together into a poem. And you may, as I go through it, work out which objects they were and which was just adding. It's called Dinner Time. Charlotte the Chameleon swiveled her right eye, attracted by the antics of a peacock butterfly, caught up in the cobwebs, swathed across the ceiling of an upstairs bathroom where the paint was peeling. Mm -hmm. Charlotte the Chameleon sensed her dinner beckoned, stretched one zigodactylous foot, followed by a second. Her stomach rumbled gently as she crept across the loo and up the nameless pot plant while turning darker blue. Charlotte greeted, aimed, fired like a spring unsprung, glued the lepidopteran with her sticky tongue. <laughs> the hapless insect panicked, did a full backspin, fluttered all four wings madly. Charlotte reeled it in. Charlotte the chameleon, now replete and mellow, chomped contentedly, then belched, blushed from green to yellow. <laughs> I've got an organ harvest as well, because like all of us who are in Highgate Poets, I'm in it. It's one of the advantages of membership that you get into these lovely publications. And I'm going to read a poem from this, which is a villanelle. Um, I'm, I'm accident prone, because I'm a clumsy person that I rush, so I keep falling into, out of, or under things. And in the past decade, I've had a couple of accidents on public transport. <coughs> I wrote a villanelle about the first one, which I uh, got second prize somewhere. So I thought I'd better do one about the second one. But in between the two, I reached a time of my life, which some of you may know, most of you are far too young to have got to yet, when you pass a sort of magic boundary and people start treating you differently. <laughs> you become basically a decrepit half-wit <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of falling down. I didn't have a fall. I merely fell. <laughs> it's not the onset of senility. No need to shout. I hear you very well. Okay, my knee and shoulder hurt like hell, but they will mend. Please set my good arm free. I didn't have a fall. I nearly fell. I'm not about to bid my wits farewell. It was a slippery step that vanquished me. You didn't shout. I hear you very well. You might try using one less decibel. <laughs> My eyesight's fine. I see you perfectly. <coughs> and that was not a fall. I nearly fell. I often do, in fact. I'm no gazelle, but I still run. Stop patronising me, and please don't shout. I hear you very well. Against this labelling, I must rebel. It will be having falls next, probably. I didn't have a fall. I merely fell. For the last time, don't shout. I hear quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Before I retired, I worked as a solicitor and I practiced family law, uh, both in the public sector and the private sector. And one of the least favorite jobs that I had to do was applying for injunctions for witnesses, victims of domestic violence. It's deeply frustrating and unsatisfactory work for a number of reasons, which I won't go into. 
Um, there's been a lot of poems written from the point of view of the victims. I think also from the point of view of the perpetrators, there's been a few. As far as I know, this is the first one from the point of view of the solicitor. <laughs> and having played around with it for a while, um, I found that I had to put the solicitor in the second person because I wanted to distance myself from it a little bit. And she is a victim, he is the perpetrator. I'm sorry for these stereotypes, but that's the way 99 times out of 100 actually happens. Uh, and you is the solicitor. I've never tried it to an audience in this actual format before, so we'll see how it works. Interview for an injunction. Her young, unfinished face, its fine bones marred by bruises, vivid blue eyes stare timidly. This is the third assault and your fourth case this week. She volunteers more wounds, finger imprints on throat and thighs. Her child plucks at her, whinging, under her limp, wandering hand, the second lies like lead in her womb. It's hard to concentrate. You are her fairy godmother who, she hopes, with your magic wand, can turn his fury to love, or at least make him stop. So you explain what is possible, what you can do, and the judge, but what she must do also. She shrinks. She will do nothing. A gulf plunges between you, hopelessness, helplessness. Though you try to reach out to her, you don't understand this fear of safety, when in her world, abuse is confused with caring. This is a little poem which is called in no, it isn't. I'm going to read something quite different because I think that happened after that one. Um, this is probably when there might be a mass exodus because this is a poem about my cat. <laughs> <laughs> and I know there's a lot of cat poems out there, but this is my poem about my cat. And I see Sarah's about to go already. It's not long, Sarah, it is it? We had, when we were doing the anthology, we had this big argument about poems about cats and flowers. <laughs> and there's something else too, but I forget what it was. Big hugs. Well, I was settled for an evening's read. Book, coffee, all remote controls in reach. In vain, for here she comes. Hug me, she says. Is it attention, love, or just my warmth she wants? Hug me. And settles into my embrace, purring. Stabs my thigh with her back claws, then stretches out, relaxes. Hug me. Both hands needed, I abandon caffeine and culture, and we drift together into a kind of bliss. Hug me more. I stroke her ears, rub along her slightly open mouth, cup her paws like buds now. My head clicks forward, waking me up. She twitches in her sleep. What does she dream of? Mice, birds, or the big black tom who storms the cat flap, devours her food. She's woken herself now, moves sleepily down to my feet. Hands freed, I raise my discarded book and reach for the cold coffee. I feel my loss. <laughs> and I think I'm going to finish with quite a long poem, but I think I've got time for it. It's about my grandmother. It's a story she told me, and as far as I know it's true, but of course I wasn't there to verify it. Uh, her name was Grace, and she grew up in a very nice little seaside town just outside Edinburgh called Portobello. Uh, uh, and she had a very strict religious upbringing of the rather cheerless 
Presbyterian kind. Grace takes to the sea. She heard the story of Jesus at the Sea of Galilee, how he walked upon the waters. Questioned how this could be. It's all a matter of faith, Grace, the minister answered her. Jesus had faith in our Father, so a miracle could occur. Hmm? Now, Grace was a willing pupil, attentive in Sunday school, obedient, believing, devoted, but also a bit of a fool. So she put her trust in Jesus and armed by faith against fear, after the evening service, she walked to the end of the pier. <laughs> I've got lots of faith, she murmured, and I know it worked for him. <laughs> then she stepped out onto the water. She never had learned to swim. After sinking deep down to the bottom, she bobbed up like a rubber duck. Then, buoyed by her skirts and bloomers, plus a fair amount of luck, she splashed her way through the shallows. There wasn't much of a swell, and it was low tide, but in April that water is cold as hell. <laughs> by the time she beached, she was sodden. Her hair was soaking too. Her ringlets had turned to rat's tails, and her mouth slightly blue. Worse, the new boots she was so proud of were completely waterlogged. She squelched like a bed of seaweed with every step she trod. You silly girl, scolded her father. Her mother just shook her head as she stripped the salt rags from her daughter and bundled her into bed. Questions were raised in the parish, exactly who was to blame. Grace stayed in bed for a fortnight, acquiring a certain fame and rather more notoriety. When the minister came to call, her father, a long-time elder, socked his jaw in the hall. <laughs> Grace recovered and pondered. She didn't exactly grow wise, but came to regard her adventure as a childish enterprise. She had a robust constitution. Though she went to church no more, she put her face in the ocean and was bathing at 84. <laughs> <laughs>